right. Well, hello. My name is Dr. Brianna Jackson, and I am an Egyptologist specializing in the Amarna period uh, and international relations. Currently, I am a visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute in the Department of the History of Art and Design, and I am also an adjunct assistant professor at Baruch College of the City University in New York um, in the History Department. So this is a recording of my conference paper for the 73rd annual meeting of the American Research Center in Egypt and for a recording of the live in-person presentation that was recorded by RC, visit the link in the description box below. It will take you to Vimeo, um, where they have uh, uploaded the original lecture. So my presentation is called Diplomacy Through Shared Th Solar Theologies, a New Examination of Egyptian Mitannian Relations. Of the 382 surviving Amarna letters, the ones that receive probably the most attention are the 12 letters sent by Tushrata, king of the Ani, to Amenhotep III. Hello. There we go. All right. Um, sent to Amenhotep III and Akhenaten. Uh, not only do the Tushrata letters provide the most detailed accounts of diplomacy between Egyptian and Near Eastern kings in the second half of the 18th dynasty, but also I think we cannot disregard their entertainment value from our modern perspectives. There is undeniably sincere expression of emotion underlying the diplomatic language formulae. We find this in the gifts Tushrata continues to send to his sister Giluhepa, who had married Amenhotep III in the latter's 10th regnal year in 1380 BCE. We might find a measure of cheerfulness in his letters to Amenhotep III, and we most certainly find frustration and even mounting desperation in his letters to Akhenaten in the face of the latter's seeming disinterest, as well as the growing threat of the Hittites. Also apparent in the letters, which has gotten some attention mostly in Near Eastern studies, is an acknowledgement of and even sharing of each other's gods. Tushrata only ever mentions uh, one Egyptian god, Amanu, that is Amun. The others are Hurrian deities, Teshup, Shaushka, Shemigi, and occasionally Iyashari, whom I will not be discussing in this lecture because he is not directly relevant to solar theology. Uh, this paper will examine the 12 Tushrata letters and the roles that deities played in the diplomatic affairs between Egypt and Mitanni, with particular attention paid to gods with solar attributes. Amenhotep III ruled from 1390 to 1352 BCE, just shy of his fourth said festival, a jubilee celebrated in the uh, celebrated first in the 30th regnal year and every three or four years thereafter. On the occasion of his first said festival, Amenhotep III instituted a vigorous monument building program, namely his palace and temple city called House of Rejoicing at the site now called Melkata, as well as a temple at Soleb in Nubia. He deified himself and adopted the epithet Atin Chehen, dazzling sun disk, which was also the name of the associated town recently excavated by an Egyptian mission in 2020. At Soleb, his deified form was a lunar god named Nebmaatre, Lord of Nubia. Together, the deified solar and lunar forms of Amenhotep III governed the entire cosmos, both day and night. His deification and assimilation with the sun itself reveal that Amenhotep III was developing new ideas in solar theology, which would be developed even further by his successor Akhenaten. Evidence suggests that Akhenaten, as Prince Amenhotep, was living at Malkata during Amenhotep III's reign, and an Amarna letter, but not a Tushrata letter, also indicates Akhenaten was receiving letters in his own palace, constructed at Thebes, before he moved the capital to Amarna. 
an oft-quoted text dating to Amenhotep III's reign further illustrates solar theological trends found on the twin stele of the architects Suti and Hor. The texts, while not particularly revolutionary, highlight the prominence of solar gods and their collective control of the cosmos and life on Earth. The text has been considered by some to have in part inspired the hymn to the Aten. Such was the religious climate during the last decade of Amenhotep III's reign when Tushrata was ruling in Mitanni. Like Akhenaten, Tushrata was not originally the heir apparent. Upon the death of his father, Shatarna II, the throne passed to Tushrata's elder brother, Arta Shumara, who was assassinated not long afterwards. It is unknown how long Shatarna and Arta Shumara ruled, and so far the only known datable reference to Shatarna's reign is the commemorative scarab celebrating Amenhotep III's marriage to Giluhepa in his 10th regnal year, in 1380 BCE. At that time, Giluhepa was most likely around 14 or 15 years old. In Tushrata's first letter to Amenhotep III, he mentions he was very young, possibly meaning he was unable, unable to rule in his own right. Scholars have thus guessed at a date in the early 1360s for Tushrata's brother's assassination and the forcible removal of young Tushrata from the throne. After defeating the Hittites some years later, Tushrata managed to reclaim his throne, possibly in the early 1350s. By this time, his own daughter was of marriageable age, that is, 14 or 15 years old. In short, the throne passed to Tushrata sometime between Amenhotep III's 10th through 36th regnal years, or 1380 to 1352 BCE. Amarna Letter 17 appears to be an early letter sent to restore an alliance between Mitanni and Egypt, which would then be cemented by a marriage between Amenhotep III and Tushrata's daughter Taduhepa. Amenhotep III was still married to Tushrata's sister Giluhepa, who was likely approaching 40 years old by this time. Now that we have gotten the cursory background out of the way, I turn now to the 12 Tushrata letters. I think it is worth mentioning that these are the surviving letters, uh, there may have been more letters from Tushrata that do not survive. Also, we do not have copies of the letters that would have been sent to Tushrata from Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and Queen T. Therefore, we must remember that we do not have a complete story. Nevertheless, I think there is enough to make what I hope will be a convincing argument. I have already mentioned that Tushrata refers to the Hurrian gods Teshub, Shemigi, and Shaushka in several of his letters. The only Egyptian god he mentions by name is Amun. On one other occasion, he refers to a gift that was sent from Ehibi, which has been identified as Heliopolis, the cult site of Re. But Tushrata instead calls Re by the name of the Hurrian god Shemigi. Following Jan Asman, Mark Smith, in his book, God in Translation, Deities and Cross-Cultural Discourse in the Biblical World, refers to the acknowledgement of each other's deities as a translation, an equivalent expression of the deity's attributes from one culture to another. The Shrata addresses only the Egyptian god Amun rather than any other Egyptian deity as a translation, or three Mitannian gods, Teshub, Shimigi, and Shaushka. Amun, as the primary god, is translated as Teshub, the Mitannian primary god. Teshub, however, was a storm god, while Amun was, in simple terms, a sun god. In the Levant, Seth is the one equated with the storm god, but Tushrata is not referring to the storm association, rather the supreme god association. With Shimigi, Tushrata is pointing out an... Hmm, Sorry, uh, an equality with Amun in Amun's attribute as a sun god, which makes the most sense among the three pairings. Shaushka is a great deal more complicated, and I find tends to be oversimplified in treatment on the relevance of her statue that is sent to Egypt. Uh, in this slide, I described the Amun and uh, Shaushka relationship as counterparts of each other. Shaushka is the protagonist 
of Amarna letter 23, the only one that has a confirmed date. This is inscribed at the end of the letter in ink in Egyptian hieratic. The date reads year 36, fourth month of winter, day one. The king was in the southern villa of the House of Rejoicing, which means he was in his palace at Melkata. The, cune the cuneiform text reads, Thus Shaushka of Nineveh, mistress of all lands, I wish to go to Egypt, the country that I love, and then return. Uh, now I hear with send her, and she is on her way. Now in the time, too, of my father, she went to this country, and just as earlier she dwelt there, and they honored her. May my brother now honor her ten times more than before. May my brother honor her, then at his pleasure let her go, so that she may come back. May Shaushka, the mistress of heaven, protect us, my brother and me, one hundred thousand years, and may our mistress grant both of us great joy. And let us act as friends. Is Shaushka for me alone my goddess, and for my brother not his goddess? The text reveals that a statue of the goddess Shaushka was sent to Egypt to visit and be honored. In Near Eastern religion, Shaushka is the equivalent of Ishtar of Nineveh. Ishtar is also a goddess of war and of love, and her celestial embodiment is a star. In Hittite religion, she also had healing attributes. This latter attribute has led some scholars to think she was sent as a gesture to help Amenhotep III to overcome a sickness. Moreover, Amenhotep III's affinity for Sekhmet statues has further convinced scholars that the goddess of pestilence was so prevalent in Amenhotep III's statue program because she was being called upon to heal him or protect against uh, countrywide disease. But Shaushka's associations with war and health are never mentioned. She is most, of, most often associated with making Tadukhepa seem beautiful in Amenhotep III's eyes. In Amarna letter 20, Toshrata prays that both Shaushka and Amun both uh, will make Tadukhepa beautiful to Amenhotep III, suggesting an equality between the two gods and a counterpart relationship. It has been argued that Shaushka was sent to accompany Mitannian princesses when they were sent to marry Amenhotep III. When Shatarna sent Shaushka, it may have been when he sent Giluhepa to marry Amenhotep III. Likewise, during Tushrata's reign, she may have been sent to accompany his daughter Taduhepa. In Amarna letter 21, Tushrata states, May Shimigi and Shaushka go before her. Concerning Taduhepa's departure to Egypt. It is unclear whether this means statues of both gods were sent or if this was simply a form of prayer. This interpretation of the goddess's visit makes sense due to her attributes relating to love and sex, thus also assimilating her with the Egyptian goddess Hathor. What I have not found in current scholarship and which I think is worth considering is the potential solar aspect of Shaushka. As the equivalent of Ishtar, Shaushka would be a star, but she is never associated with such in the Tushrata letters. Instead, she is given universalizing attributes as the mistress of all lands and the mistress of heaven, which are epithets associated with Hathor. Hathorizing motifs are found in Mitannian art, namely the palace paintings in the Mitannian city Nuzi. Comparing this painting to the ceiling painting at Melkata shows clear iconographic influence in both directions, an example of the so-called international style that Marion Feldman explores in her book Diplomacy by Design. The Melkata Palace ceiling painting shows cow heads with rosettes symbolizing the sun couched between the horns. Whorls with inset rosettes form an alternating pattern. The wall painting from the governor's palace at Nuzi displays frontal female heads with cow ears and hair that terminates in curls. Undeniably similar to the hybrid human and cow head format of Hathor in Egyptian art and architecture and the vessel from Melkata that is included at this, uh, uh, on this slide. The Nuzi painting also has cow heads equivalent to the Melkata ceiling paintings. Um, but instead of rosettes, tiny discs, 
they cross pattern are placed between the horns. Rosettes, swirls, and papyrus plants are painted on the Mitannian vessels as well. Moreover, a ceramic plaque found at al Alaq and dating to the 14th century BCE, therefore contemporaneous with Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, depicts Shaushka with a winged sun disk above her head. In Egyptian religion, Hathor is a female counterpart of the king, pictorially represented here in the painting from the tomb of Kerueth, showing Hathor enthroned with Amenhotep III during his said festival, while Queen T stands behind. Shaushka translated as Hathor would thereby fulfill the same role. In the letter itself, Taduhepa is not mentioned together with Shaushka. Rather, Shaushka is sent to be honored by Amenhotep III, and Tushrata establishes her as a universal goddess that binds their diplomatic relationship. Shaushka in this specific letter, therefore, is associated with kingship, similar to Hathor, and not directly with marriage. If Shaushka is meant to be conflated with Sekhmet, it would more likely, I think, be in relation to Sekhmet's solar attributes, rather than healing and war, despite the two goddesses sharing the healing and war attributes. Sekhmet is one of the many goddesses of, uh, identified as the Eye of Ray. She is the angry form of Hathor who flees southward to Nubia, so even in this case, Shaushka would still have some connection to Hathor. Shemigi is considerably easier to equate with Egyptian gods as he is the Hurrian sun god. In art, Shemigi appears as a winged sun disk or as a man with a winged sun disk appearing above his head, as demonstrated by this line drawing of an ivory plaque from Megiddo. In the Amarna letters, Tushrata appeals to the universality of their gods. Amarna letter 24, a rather long letter, is full of references to Shemigi, but much of it is too fragmentary to reproduce here to any effect. However, there are three passages that are quite useful. Previously, I mentioned that in EA24, Tushrata refers to the Egyptian god Re as the Hurrian god Shemigi and identifies Shemigi as being Amenhotep III's god and father. In EA20, Shemigi is referred to simply as the sun. In this passage, Tushrata points out the universal worship of the sun and the uh, love for the sun that all people possess is equal to the bonds of diplomacy. Tushrata refers again to the universal aspect of Shemigi in EA24 and once more equates shared solar worship to a strong diplomatic relationship. Most intriguing is the phrase, and all the lands that exist on the earth that Shemigi shines upon. We find this same concept in the hymn to the Aten, as well as the aforementioned stele of Suti and Hor. A common theme is that all eyes see the sun, and the sun is in every land, meaning that all people in the world are united under the shared experience of sunlight. Whether or not Tushrata was specifically appealing to Amenhotep III's strong interest in solar theology is unclear, but it is significant. I think that the individual texts presented here share similar concepts of the universality of the sun, not only concerning an obvious celestial body in the sky, but also concerning a shared theology. Returning again to my concept map, I present the deity translations. Teshup and Amun are the primary gods of Mitanni and Egypt, respectively. Their particular attributes of storm and sun are not important in this instance, but the fact that they have a primary god that the kings can each translate into their own respective gods creates the most basic common ground between them. Amun and Shaushka each possess solar attributes as well as particular association with kingship. Therefore, they may be considered counterparts of each other. Two parts that create a whole, or two kings who create a bond between them through shared gods and marriage alliances. Finally, Amun, Re, and Shemigi may be viewed as the same god without any distinction between them. This presents two individual kings from two different lands who worship not only the same god but also its universal properties. Because they share the same god, they by default must share a diplomatic bond. Mitanni becomes 
Amenhotep III's country, and Egypt becomes Tushratta's country, united under the light of the sun. Interestingly, no gods are mentioned in Tushratta's letters to Akhenaten and T. Tushratta instead adopts more straightforward language and often appeals to Akhenaten as a father-in-law and uses the second person, you, to address him, perhaps to establish some form of power play to salvage the disintegrating alliance between them. Soon after Akhenaten took the throne, Ashrata lost his when he was assassinated. The Hittite Empire swallowed up Mitanni while Akhenaten was flourishing at Amarna. But as we know, this too came to an untimely end. Thank you.